It is a vast cradle for marine life, a sport fisherman's dream, a reservoir of fossil fuels, an incomparable source of protein from the sea, and a challenge to divers. The gulf is the most. Hello, I'm Stan Waterman. I'm a professional skin diver and underwater photographer. I've been wedded to the sea for 25 years by vocation and avocation. 25 years of a wonderful experience. I suppose the most exciting experience that I've had was pursuing the great white shark. We sought around the world in, in making Blue Water White Death, the feature film. We're off on another adventure this morning, a different one. Sunrise on the bayous of Louisiana, following up an invitation by Gulf Coast diving friends who for years have urged me to come down and see a new marine world that was developed under the production platforms offshore in the Gulf Coast. A great network of artificial reefs, an ecosystem following the entire food chain up to the great commercial schools of fishes. I've never seen anything like it. This year, I accepted the invitation. And so, with the sun rising behind us and a day to fulfill our adventures, we're on our way out to the Gulf now. It's a calm day on the Gulf. One of my diving friends catches 40 more winks as the eggs are scrambled for breakfast. The crew boats pass us as if we're dragging anchor. They rev up to 35 and 40 knots. We soon find ourselves passing through the communities of drill rigs and production platforms, reassuring neighbors for small craft ranging far out into the open gulf. The shrimp boats are a part of the busy traffic pattern, harvesting the most valuable crop of marine crustacea in the world. Whole fleets of sport fishing boats will start out from the coast each morning on a calm day like this, each one eventually picking the platform where he thinks the action will be. And for action and clear water, we're headed for the deep platform, standing in 140 feet of water. All right. We'll take our lights down with us, too. Oh, gosh, I can see the um, I can see the stuff all over the pilings already. Barnacles look like they're almost an inch thick. Uh, there's a green algae growing right at the surface. And this is Bert Tettleton, one of the finest skin divers on the Gulf Coast. This should have about a one and one half inches of growth on the pilings. Terrific. Well, we're going to find big schools of fish down here. Drop right down on a lot of action. I certainly hope so, but you know the hurricane may have spoiled the marine life. <laughs> what is this hurricane business here? The Chamber of Commerce told me it was a great climate. Just about at this time, in the middle of August, old Mother Nature spoiled our plans by planting a hurricane cross. <laughs> okay, <laughs> I'm used to it as a filmmaker. <laughs> of the steel reef like no marine environment I have ever been in before. Great Barracuda were our reception committee, curious but not aggressive. Legions of spade fish sweep by majestically. As long as our movements are unhurried and easy, we will be accepted without disturbance in this diverse marine community. There's 
beauty under these platforms, a symmetrical beauty, the men swimming through the centralizers that once guided the drill shafts to the bottom. When you're just halfway down one of the supporting members, you're already 70 feet deep, and the surface is a distant, shimmering mirage. All of the Gulf Coast divers are shell collectors, amateur malacologists, and they know just where to look for the valuable shells that they will add to their collections. Wow! What a sight! It's not like a forest! Great, huh? Blown up for... I love those spade fish! They weren't as thick as they usually are. Well, that was it. Well, they were barracuda. Amberjack. All right. Maybe we'll shoot an amberjack later on. As long as you can eat them. <laughs> Boy, that water is warm. Yeah, it's great. If it's so warm, why are you so blue? <laughs> <laughs> well, it's a little cool down at the bottom. <laughs> Here's the prize. The species is Spondylus americanus. One in perfect condition can be worth as much as $50 in the collector's market. We moved on to another block of rigs. Dan, this is an old gun, but it's my old favorite. Never fails. Let me see what you're doing to that thing. Holy smoke! <laughs> that, that isn't going to take too much impact. Right. Well, I don't spearfish much anymore, but it, it helps to bring back a, a delicacy for the wife at times. Oh, God, right. Oh. All right. You all ready? Yeah, fine. Okay, let's go. Amberjack. They're after Amberjack today. The biggest ones I've ever seen come in on these rigs. The great pelagic jacks come in from the open sea to feed on the fish that live under the platforms. And man in turn preys on them. Burr stalks a big Amberjack. He takes aim, fires at point-blank range, and misses. He's gung-ho, if not accurate at this particular moment. This time, he strikes hard and well. The fish heads for the bottom. They're powerful. They'll drag a diver along with them. If they can make it to the 85 or 90-foot level, the Merc level, they're in free because you dare not follow them into the zero visibility. Berg grapples with the reserve on his tank, and in doing so, he goes head first into one of the cross members on the rig. The rig didn't move an inch. You must watch your depth constantly. You'll be in deep water before you know it in the excitement of the chase. But Burr does check this fish's descent, brings him back towards the surface and now back to the boat. This is a big one. The amberjack aren't the best eating of the jacks by any means, but they're good eating, and this fellow will be made up into steaks for three different families ashore. The men, of course, are out to fill their larders, but they're also after records, and many of the species grow to record sizes here. There's the face of a man developing a hernia. Burr Cox's spear gun again. It's a twin-strand arbalet, a very standard gun for hunting. He's after barracuda this time, and they also grow big under these platforms, some of the biggest I've ever seen. Barracuda takes off like a shot. He'll wind around the supporting members of the rig, and every time he takes a turn, Burr has to follow him and unwind him in the same direction. Incidentally, the only time that I've heard of 
when a barracuda attacked a spear fisherman, the only documented record was when a man struck one and wounded it, and the cuda turned and bit the devil out of him, and he deserved it too. Barracuda will usually leave you alone if you leave them alone. But if you strike them, then you've picked the fight, and you can take your chances. This is a big one too. He'll go over 25 pounds easily, and that's big as cuda go. They used to call Barracuda the tigers of the sea, their ferocity towards divers and swimmers much overrated. As I mentioned before, if you leave the Barracuda alone, he'll leave you alone. Human beings are not the normal prey for a Cuda. We move on to another block of platforms that have attracted commercial fishermen. Here's one of the snapper boats part of a fleet of over 50 that arrive from the Florida coast each summer to work these waters. The snapper fishery is an outgrowth of the development of oil rigs as artificial reefs along the Gulf Coast. The oil rigs have been neither conducive nor prohibitive to the shrimp business. Shrimp continue to thrive on the mud sand bottom of the Gulf and a huge multi-million dollar shrimp business continues to thrive also. Here's the start of a shrimp cocktail for gourmet restaurants across the country. It is sport fishing that has experienced a bonanza all year round. Before a platform has set its legs on the Gulf bottom for just half a year, it has already attracted a vigorous and diverse marine ecosystem that includes many of the fish most prized by sport fishermen. Many species of jacks, like this one coming up aboard. They're all superb fighters on light tackle. Sea trout, barracuda, snapper, and redfish. Remember, it doesn't have to be a monster to be fun. It looks like he's lassoed this one. Shortly after the first platforms appeared along the coast, the oceanic game fish also began to appear. The magnificent dolphin, rainbow lightning, and the most colorful of all game fish. The angler's great challenge and prize, the blue marlin. In fact, so many marlin and sailfish entered the Gulf that a major bill fishing tournament prospers here every year now. Here's a magnificent white marlin to fulfill any angler's dream. I met Dr. Carl Oppenheimer, chief marine biologist at the University of Texas. Dr. Oppenheimer was examining the stomach contents of fish being brought aboard one of the party boats, a field exercise he usually enjoys with the chance to wet a line himself. I filmed him at work and learned much from him. Yes, this is a redfish. It's one of the more popular game fishes in the Gulf of Mexico. They grow to fairly good size, and this is a, a fairly decent sized adult. We're taking the stomach out now to see if we can get some idea of, of the uh, contents as to what it's been eating. These, uh, these fish are attracted to uh, any solid uh, reef type of structure, whether it be man-made or whether it be a natural reef. You don't mind my asking you these questions while you're working here. I don't want to d distract you and have the patient die on the operating table. I'm afraid this patient's already dead. <laughs> we've seen great schools of these cruising around the, the, um, the rigs when we've been diving. What draws them to the, uh, to the rigs if they're open water fish? Well, they're, uh, they're drawn just like almost any other animal in the sea is towards, uh, towards solid surfaces again. Um, we've known this fact for quite a number of years, but we don't know exactly the total sequence of why fishes are attracted to solid surfaces like platforms, oil rigs that are becoming so abundant now in the Gulf of Mexico and old car bodies. Japanese are using uh, concrete uh, artificial reefs and actually placing the reefs out in the ocean to increase uh, to increase the productivity for the fishermen. 
And this is being done here in the Gulf of Mexico and the Pacific and the Atlantic. Dr. Oppenheimer, here's a fish that was just caught up on a bar, one of the more oh. common <laughs> fish, the white trout. Right. When you get the trout we out here too? We certainly do. We catch white trout, we catch speckled trout, and uh, this is one of the fish that abound by the rigs in great numbers. It's oh, you've got everything out here. Oh, this very, is too we're, much. We're very fortunate. Uh, isn't he a it's a beauty? Very good edible uh, fish. The edibility of it is very good. It's a clean fish and it's a good sport fish on light tackle. Is this a big one or about this? This would be called a small one. Right, sir. You know, this must be some of the most reliable and steady sport fishing you can find anywhere. Well, I, I think this is one of the few areas where we can say we catch fish every time. We'll practically guarantee fish because you've got so many places to fish. On the Louisiana coast, you've got 1,400 oil structures or maybe a few more than that. And it's all uh, man-made reefs. I mean, it's put there to get the oil out, but without the rigs and the structures, I wouldn't be in business here. So it'd be, we'd have to depend mostly on game fishing, trolling for mauling and such as that. Whereas during this winter time and all, when the water's too rough to go way out, we can fish on all these close rigs and you can see the variety of fish we catch. Then you really hit them, don't you? And so they do. Later on another boat, I spoke further with Dr. Oppenheimer. Dr. Oppenheimer, where does it start? What comes first to these artificial structures to begin the whole process? These structures provide a biologically attractive surface, initially colonized by bacteria, that act as a primary base for other attached life. And then from this broth of living organisms in the surrounding seawater, a sequence of unicellular algae, protozoans, and other larval microscopic organisms attach. As a result, dense moss-like colonies will develop, consisting of such microscopic creatures as this larval bryozoan and this delicate anemone. The larval stages of starfish and sea urchins, clams, oysters, and snails will then settle to share with these larval crabs a new habitat. These larval fish will also find protection and food to develop. These animals and many more will find the new artificial reefs a suitable habitat and a new balanced ecosystem will result with the incrustation of every inch of the underwater platform structures, a veritable pasture of plants and animals. Barnacles will sweep smaller planktonic food from the rich water with bristle lacy feet and periodically enrich the surrounding water with a cloud of eggs and sperm as these sea urchins are doing. All this growth results in the production of great amounts of food, which in turn supports clouds of fish fry. These millions of small fish will become food for larger fish, which will provide sport and food for man in his position at the top of the food chain. A growing commercial fishery may harvest those fish that reach maturity. And too, these barracuda occupy the pinnacle of the pyramid of the food chain with man a pyramid reaching all the way down from the first bacteria to settle on the new underwater structures. We tied up to a crew boat for an overnight berth. The snapper is the best eating of the Gulf Coast fish, and I was eager to try one. Dinner aboard the rig with the manager and the crane hoist operator provided the opportunity. Holy oh, Cook work. rose to the challenge brilliantly. We're going to have to make room here. Uh, you mean to tell me you do this kind of thing three times a day all year round? Three times a day. You guys really <laughs> live it up out here. <laughs> yeah. You don't have to wait. You, you, you did three times. Time. Uh, yeah, well, I thought he looked good underwater. When you landed <laughs> that, that bullseye shot, he looks better now. Yeah. At this particular time, I think I'd just as soon be at the top of the food chain. <laughs> oh, and I think the cook's watching us to see if any of this is going to be left. And yeah, he I gets, don't have any intention of leaving I any of it. I don't believe there is. Where you like the, the you like the fins, don't you? Yeah. Don't try. Well, You're really that. sweet around the fins. <laughs> <laughs> I asked Burr about the coming of new species to the yeah, marine that, world that, under the platforms. Great. I've seen changes such as... Uh, new tropical species migrating into the area. You mean fish that, that weren't, that you didn't see here ten years ago? Coming from where? From from, from distant waters? And yeah, uh, from uh, the Caribbean, a branch of the Gulf Stream branches off in the summer months and 
comes right directly toward the mouth of the Mississippi. So whether they're introduced as adults or as collegiate eggs, uh, they, they're still showing up new ones each year. Well, last year uh, we discovered the reef butterfly, which is the least common of all the Bahamian butterflies. The next morning, we made our last dive together, and it was by far the finest of our series. The stingray, much maligned, not the villain he's made out to be, an eater of crabs, of crustacea and mollusks. You practically have to step on him to get him to use that poison barb in his tail. He almost knocks Burr off of his perch there on the stanchion. Burr struggling with one of his flash bulbs. Underwater photographers always struggle with flash bulbs, I can assure you. He glides by with powerful rhythmic strokes of his wing-like body. He's coming up for a hug and a kiss here, the friendly stingray. Jack Crevel's Kerenx Hippos, the most beautiful of all of the jacks. These have come from deep water, excited by the sound of our bubbles and our diving activity. Amberjack, even larger than the ones that we had seen before. The view was all in lines, straight up and down, as we moved deeper along the water column. Each new area has its own spectrum of life. At 70, 75, 80 feet, I must turn on my lights. This is the twilight zone. And here in deep water, we finally found the snappers. They'd been here all along, but deep, driven here by the hurricane and the gulf in storm time. The lights pick up the burnished red of their scales. The queen angelfish from Florida waters arrived on the steel reefs many years ago. Burr cataloged them when they first came about 15 years past. Triggerfish, they graze on the encrusted material, also came from the Florida reefs. One by one, the spectrum of life has grown. Burr has cataloged it as he's seen the new additions. The French angelfish, Pomacanthus paru, arrived about seven years back. And then today, seen for the first time, and very exciting to Burr, the gray angelfish. Pomacanthus arcoatus, cataloged, noted for the first time. And so the range of life grows. You must watch your time carefully. We've slipped over a hundred feet deep now. The decompression meter tells you when it's time to come up, as will your depth gauge and your wristwatch. There is no equivocating when it's time to go it's time to go. Into the zone of light, through the area of spade fish, out through the bars of the great cage into the open gulf beyond. The men on the surface world watch us return from a world they will never see. Their eyeballs almost popped out of their heads when they saw the size of these snappers we'd taken. They dangle hooks and they never catch them like that. Now any diver will tell you that the best time of day is called the happy hour. Whatever the toast, we drink together now as veteran divers on the steel reefs a new adventure in my diving experience, and a fine one I'll not forget. I've enjoyed sharing this story with you, and hope that we may dive together again soon.